um, to present for you all um, around strategies that um, that families can use at home. So we're going to get right into it because we only have 50 minutes and I want to make sure that you get every all the information that uh, you came here for. So today, again, we're talking about um, strategies for supporting diverse learners at home. Uh, my name is Kate Schuster. These are, this is Link's Twitter handle. If you want to follow us on, uh, on Twitter, we, have, we share our blog posts and um, our uh, events that we're doing. So please give us a follow. And down here is also my um, Twitter handle if you want to check us out there. All right, so just so you know who you're talking to, um, here I am before my first day of school um, as a teacher, way back in 2008. <laughs> I taught first grade um, in, the, um, in the Bronx, um, primarily English language learners. Uh, I also was an administrator in New York City Public Schools. Um, and for the past few years, I've been working as a coach at um, the Learning Innovation Catalyst. And I work in school districts all across the country, New York City, Connecticut, um, Illinois, uh, New Jersey. So really excited to be here with you all in Nevada. I'm currently in the suburbs of Chicago. So nice to be with all, you, all of you today. And feel free to use the chat. Um, I will be checking that. Uh, throughout our time today, time today. So just feel free to do that and we will check in. All right, so here is our objective for today. Um, we're gonna talk about how families um, can examine strategies to support children with diverse learning needs. At the end of the session, I'm gonna have a lot of, of resources for you, um, whether you are a parent yourself, um, you know, a parent or guardian yourself, or if you are a teacher, or other staff member so that you can share these resources with the families that you work with. So first we're going to start off with the why. Why is it important to meet your child's needs to be successful in school? Then we're gonna talk about some specific strategies that teachers use in our classrooms to support students with various needs that you should know about. Um, I've had lots of conversations when I was a teacher about some strategies that I did in the classroom that can support their child at home. So again, whether or not you are a, a parent or a guardian um, or you're a teacher, these are some strategies that you can either use yourself as a parent or guardian or teach um, your, um, your families to, in, to use at their, uh, with their child. And then lastly, we're going to close out with some of those resources that you can take yourself or share with others. Um, and we'll have some time for Q&A, hopefully. All right, let's first start off with the why. Super important to understand that first. So I really love this image, right? Every child is like a flower. Each one needs different things in order to grow. So just like some flowers, right? Some students need more of one thing and less than another, including when they're at home, um, when they're doing their their homework or their schoolwork or other projects or even even just things with you around in their home right so we all they all have different needs it's also important to note that just because a strategy that you might be using with one child that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to work for for other children in your in your same household right so a lot of these strategies are a little bit of a trial and error process to find what meets the need of your specific child. So it's really important to know that, right? Just because one thing works with one child doesn't mean the same strategy is going to work with your other children. Another important note, students need their learning needs met before they can engage in academic tasks. So for example, right, a child can't productively learn math skills if they can't focus or they're experiencing stress or anxiety. So today we're really going to be talking about some common learning needs that students have that we need to support in order for their academic learning to take place. So like I said before, these strategies that I'm laying out today are the ones that teachers use to support the needs of their students. This session came out of a blog post that I wrote. <clears throat> um, and I actually, you know, I was a teacher myself, as you know, but I actually 
went out and spoke to my colleagues who are former teachers and my, my friends who are still teachers and administrators in schools. And I talked to, I'd ask them like, what are some things that you do in your classroom with your students that you wish parents knew more about in order to support their students at home? And so I did some of this crowdsourcing um, to really figure out what are these like easy to use strategies that you can implement in order to support your, your children at home. So like I said, right, you really can use when your child is learning at home, whether it's homework or other projects, right, they may need some of these same supports in order to be successful. The supports I'm outlining today um, support children in both their academic and non-academic skills, which affect their academic abilities. So first, we're going to talk about strategies to support students with maintaining focus or staying on task. Next, we'll talk about supports um, for students who have language processing needs. This is one that a lot of families don't recognize as easily in their child. And then lastly, we're going to be talking about supports for children who have social emotional needs. So all of these suggestions that I'm outlining um, are what teachers do in their classrooms every day to address individual needs of students. And all of these strategies work with students of all ages. So you might be, ha you might be having a, you know, a high school student at home, a pre-K student at home. Um, you might be teaching one of those grades and all of, the, all of these strategies work with students across that spectrum. Okay, so now that we spoke about the why, let's move on to those actual strategies. So we're gonna look at strategies that address common needs, focus, language, and social emotional. Let's first head over to the focus. <laughs> we're gonna first look at that. So children who need supports for staying on task <clears throat> often have trouble completing work in a timely manner. So the strategies that we're going to be talking about here will support students in developing the skill of staying on task. So that's actually a skill that you have to develop over time, right? It's not something that you can automatically have when you're a child that actually is a skill that we need to teach. So these and, and be consistent about. So these strategies really help with students um, developing the skill of staying on task. All right, so first up is setting a timer. It's a really simple thing that you can do. Um, but when you set up a timer, um, you first want to make sure um, that, that, your, that, the, that your child can see the timer but can't touch it. So this is really, um, this is really important, especially for young children. Um, that, they, that they can see it, but they can't touch it because sometimes they'll want to play with the timer. Um, in, in addition, for those K through, um, you know, pre-K through second grade students, so those younger students, it's a good idea to start with a very small increment of time, five minutes, max 10 minutes, and then build up from there. So you really want to make sure that you are building goals um, with your child around the timer and how long they can stay on task. You shouldn't first, when you roll out a timer, be like, all right, 30 minutes. Especially with young children, you want to build that capacity over time. Next up, break up and, re and repeat directions. So children who struggle with focusing benefit from directions that are broken up rather than giving the directions all at once. So for example, um, ask your child to sit down and open their computer then ask them to sign on to their student account. After they are logged on, ask them to start the activity. So you're really breaking down the directions rather than saying it all at once. Awesome, I have some people in the chat um, giving some comments, great. So it's okay also to repeat verbal directions or written directions for an assignment that a student may be get given from a teacher if your child doesn't understand directions, repeat the directions and ask them to repeat the directions back to you to make sure that they understand. So again, break up the directions, 
and actually watch them as they do the dirt, the things right uh, for the directions. Um, and repeat it as many times as they need, ask them to repeat it back to you because that really helps to confirm um, that they, and for, for them and for you, to, that they know what the directions are. Yeah, timers, super simple to implement, but can be really effective for, again, teaching the skill of staying on task. Okay, so next up is posting a daily schedule. So children of all ages, ages, regardless of struggles with attention, really benefit from having a daily schedule, including when they come home from school um, and have to uh, do all of the things they have to do when they come home from school. So first up, it's really important to co-create that schedule with your child. So for example, right, when they get home, they can, you, you know, in their schedule, you might together write that they put their homework folder in a basket on the kitchen table. They eat a snack and then do their homework for 30 minutes. So they actually know what their schedule is when they come home. They can get then a brain break, right? And come back to finish their homework later. But having something posted for them is really, um, is really, really helpful. In addition, you could make a checklist. So for, for children who need more support for staying on task, you can make a schedule into a checklist um, that they keep next to them as they work and they can check it off as, as they complete it. So you can, you, know, you can make it paper copies, um, you can put it on a whiteboard. I, as an early childhood teacher, would make paper copies and then put them into a plastic sleeve. Um, and then students can use, you know, your child can use a whiteboard marker so that we, it becomes a reusable um, checklist. Yeah. Great, Laura. Yeah, some things are super, super easy to implement, but very effective. So also another important thing to do if your child is struggling to stay on task is to, if possible, create a separate workspace for your child um, to do their schoolwork. So you should choose a workspace that um, has no or limited distractions if possible, right? such as games, toys, TVs, iPads, et cetera, try to make that space a, a real workspace. And then also um, make sure there is adequate light and materials for your child to do their work, like paper, pencils, markers. Again, you really wanna cultivate this space that is meant for, for work. And then lastly, right, really engage your child in creating this for more ownership, to make the learning space feel cozy and inspiring, right? So you'll notice that both with the daily schedule and with the separate workspace, I'm really encouraging you to co-create that with your child. Um, that creates a lot more buy-in into you know, these practices that we're, that we're putting together for our, for our kids. Yeah, I love all these comments. It's so nice to have people commenting and giving ideas to each other. And we're gonna have time at the end for to open it up for questions. So keep putting things in the, in the chat. Okay, so some more things that help with um, students focusing and staying on task. Provide a fidget. So here's some examples of what fidgets are. <laughs> um, I actually have one right here on my desk because I sometimes need a fidget. So um, fidgets are a, um, are a really good tool that help children improve concentration and focus while they're doing work. So the vast majority of fidgets, the ones that I'm putting here and like mine right here are, are quiet, but they, they provide for children who need some, some support with focusing. It gives them something to do with their hands um, while, they're while they're staying on task with the, with the learning. So again, it can be, it's a really effective tool that teachers use all the time. Also, there are some really great tech tools that you can um, install on your computer that help to limit distraction. So there are Google Chrome extensions like, um, like Mercury Reader. I'll show you what this is. Again, you're going to get um, these when I, um, when I share my resources. But Mercury Reader removes ads and distractions, leaving only text and images for a clean and consistent reading view on every single website. So this is really, really helpful if you wanna get rid of the ads and other like pictures and things that might be distracting for your child. This is really good for especially our older students. 
Um, it really helps to have the child to allow the child to focus on the content rather than all of that other stimulus on the on the website. Now let's look at some um, strategies to support students who have language processing needs. So again, this is a super common one that a lot of um, parents have a hard time identifying in their child. So I this and also I was an I was a um, English language learner teacher and I taught um, I taught early childhood. A lot of students in early childhood start to have some language processing needs. So again, this is a one that's really important to me and, and dear to my heart to make sure that parents understand how to support effectively. So children who have language processing needs often struggle with verbal multi-step directions, getting started with writing and with reading comprehension. So these strategies will support students who have those needs. So first up is reading the directions. Parents often ask me if it's okay to read directions for a task allowed to their child if they are struggling to read it. The answer is yes, right? Read the math, science, or even the directions for the writing prompt, prompt allowed to your child. This will ensure that, they're act, that, they're, that they get to the actual work rather than using their energy to sound out each word in the directions. Also, if you, if you see a child who's really struggling to read the directions, like they're going very slowly, li the likelihood that they actually have comprehended those directions is very low, right? So where do we want the cognitive load of their brain to be? Is it on like reading the directions or actually doing the science task? I would argue in this instance, we want their cognitive load, right? we want their, their brain to be doing the heavy lifting in the math, and sorry, in the science project, rather than struggling to read the directions and probably even not comprehending the directions. You also can provide writing support through sentence set stems. So students who struggle with writing, in particular, like getting started with their writing, um, they can really benefit from sentence stems. So here are some examples, right? You might model or provide sentence stems to support your child, such as, I predict, or next the character. Again, you writing out, I predict, and having them actually write out what their prediction is, or giving them a sentence stem, even with speaking, next the character and have them explain what the character did. For students who have language processing needs, that simple support of a sentence stem really helps them to get started with giving you the real information that we're looking for when we're having um, you know, th these conversations with our students around um, whatever, whatever academic tasks they are, they are focused on. Okay, so another one that you can do is just previewing pictures before reading. This is particularly good for our elementary school students, right? Like third grade and younger, where there are a lot of picture supports for students in books. So first, right, you'll want to um, preview the book's pictures ahead of reading the text. Ask your child questions about the pictures to help them make meaning and connection to the story. So you can ask questions like, what do you think is happening in this picture, right? And having them go through those pictures even before they are asked to read the text is a really great way to support children in making those connections and meaning so that they can support them when they actually go to read the, to read the text. You also can use tech tools like Google Chrome extensions. And this is really good for our, especially our older students. So you can use tech tools like uh, in their Chrome extensions, um, Read and Write, which allows, um, which, which on a website takes text and makes it into, and reads it aloud to the, to the person. And also Speak It, which um, allows you to take um, text and read it aloud. These are what the, this is what they look like. 
So basically extensions like these help to balance, again, that cognitive load that students are experiencing. So for example, if they're doing a math problem and they're struggling to read the directions that are, that, you know, is, is, that are in the word problem, use, a, use, the, the, um, use the read and write extensions so that the child can have the directions read aloud to them, right? Why are we wasting their cognitive load on reading the directions when you really just want them to do the actual work in math? Of course, it's really important for students to also learn how to read, but there's another time for that where they're doing focused reading work and they're, they're working on reading comprehension, on phonics, on fluency. Again, for students who are struggling with, um, with reading, let's use some of our technology tools to support them so they actually can do the real work of the assignment. Finally, we're going to explore some supports for students who are having social emotional needs. Remember at the beginning of the session how I talked about so important to meet, to meet social emotional needs first so that children can do academic tasks? Well, here are some strategies that you can, um, you can deploy in your classroom or give out to families in order to support students who are having social emotional needs. So like academic skills, social emotional skills also need to be taught and practiced. Students who have higher social emotional needs often struggle with self-regulation of their emotions. This one hits hard for me because my, my niece, very smart, really struggles with her, with her, with her self-regulation of her emotions. She is in first grade, right? She really struggles. So, and she can't often do a lot of her academic work because she's having some, you know, some uh, needs for her, her social emotional needs. And those need to be taken care of first before she can do her academic tasks. So here are some calming uh, practice strategies that you can implement with your child or teach families to do with their children. So if your child is overwhelmed, you can use the following techniques. First is to really use a neutral tone and, and body language with your child. So do not have crossed arms and furrowed brows, right? That it actually does not support um, children in getting back on track and regulating their emotions. If possible, it's also a good idea to get down to the child's level, eye level, or sit next to them when they're talking. You know, when you're a child and you're standing and looking down at your, um, and, and your parent is, or, or a teacher is looking down at you, it's a much more intimidating stance. Um, so it's a good idea to get on eye level with your child to sit next to them so that they know that you are in this together to help get them back on track and get them calm. Another really important thing is to say what to do rather than what not to do and also be specific. So for example, instead of stop wasting time, try, sit down and take out your book and pencil, right? So I'm actually saying what I want them to do and I'm being specific. Here's another example, instead of Stop jumping on the couch, try, please sit on the couch, right? So you're redirecting them to the, the thing that you want to see rather than the thing you don't want to see. It's much clearer to a child um, to give them the expectation that well, what you want them to do. Another, another good tip is to make statements, not questions to correct a behavior. So for example, instead of, can you start your math homework? Switch to start your math homework. Sometimes when you say, can you start your math homework? A child will go, no, <laughs> I don't want to, right? So just switch your language from a, from a question into a statement. Another good strategy is to create a calm, a, a calm down space for your, um, for your child, right? And if possible, make it a separate space in your home for your child to go to in order to calm down or take a break when they are upset. Same thing in your classroom, right? Try to create a separate space for a child to calm down. So it's important to note that this is not a punishment space, but rather a space that 
children can go to for a short period of time where they know that their task is to collect themselves and come back to the learning or come back to our family, right? So they know that this is not a punishment space, but a space for them to recollect themselves. The space should, should include items that help children calm down, like pillows or stuffed animals or other things that, you know, that help them soothe themselves. I also love glitter jars, and we're gonna, I'm going to talk, I'm going to give you some um, uh, directions about how to make glitter jars. So glitter jars um, are a strategy that help, especially pre-K pre through fifth grade students, to calm down. A glitter jar um, is a, <clears throat> um, a self-regulation tool, right? Students shake it up. So this is in their calm down space. You can shake it up. Uh, shake up the jar and then you they they watch as the glitter settles to the bottom so it's a way to give children one something concrete to focus on as their as their their brain settles back down right um, and i also like that it's a um it's a visual representation of like maybe your brain right now is feeling like this glitter right but we're going to watch as it calms down and come back together on the bottom and again, we have some directions for making these at home at the end of the presentation. So you'll have them really easy, water bottle, water, glitter, and a glue to, to close the cap. And that's all you need. So again, here, there's an example of glitter jars, really easy to make. Also a good idea to create brain breaks for your child. Um, so when they're doing homework at home, when it's on the weekend and you're, ha you're having them do work or other projects, a really good idea to have some brain breaks built in. Um, so brain breaks are ways to get energy out and help reset a child's mind when they're feeling stressed or upset. You can do offline digital, like uh, uh, digital brain breaks, right? So maybe it's just like, let's do 10 jumping jacks together. Um, or you can use online tools like Go Noodle, which is um, you can uh, show it on the computer and it's just like fun dance stuff and other things that, that you can um, put on for your child that helps them to move. Often when a child is not, um, is, is really being, um, you know, uh, is having a difficult time doing this little like reset moment of like, all right, let's just like run around the house for, for three minutes and set a timer, come back together. That's all that they need in order to, to feel better and get back on task and, and do whatever it is that um, you are, you know, you're doing at the time, whether it's homework or other things with your family. Okay, so we spoke about the why, we talked about the strategies, and now we're actually going to close out with some resources and Q&A. So I want to I want to explore some pro tips before we get to that Q&A time for really instituting these strategies and then again I'm going to share some resources. So first up, you heard me say this before, but really co-create these ex these expectations with your child. Same thing with your students. If you're if you're a teacher with us today, really co you know it's really important to co-create these with with the children. It's important that they understand why you are implementing these strategies and that they have had the ability to be a part of what that implementation looks like. Really, really important that they understand why you're doing it and that they have been, they really feel empowered to have been a part of the decision-making, a part of creating the workspace of, you know, setting up their goals for their timers, right? Really important to co-create that. Consistency is key. So none of these strategies will work if you only do it two or three times. Um, it's important that you stay consistent uh, and that you're really, um, you know, implementing these over time. So, as we know, right, learning how to read or to write or to, or to do math takes a long time to develop. The same goes for these other skills. They actually take a very long time to develop and require reinforcement. So don't feel discouraged and give up if after two or three times or 10 times of doing a strategy, it doesn't work. Really stay with it. And again, reinforce the why with your child and have them be a part of developing that strategy further. Set goals and build up over time. 
So for example, start with a five minute timer, right? And then build up one minute every week. You can set a goal of being able to calm down on their own at, at least three times in a week and then build it up to four or five times in a week. You, an important note is that you want your child to feel success pretty quickly in order to stay motivated. And then you can build on that success over time. So you don't, the, the first time that you're implementing these strategies, you don't want the goal to be so big that it feels almost impossible for your child to meet it. Better to have them have a, have a smaller goal that they can get really quickly um, so that you can again really build that success over time and they can feel what it's like to be successful with that strategy. And then lastly, right, really praise your child when they are successful. You can even build in special prizes when they're consistent. So something that I always told my, my families when I worked with them is that, you know, I think a lot of us go to that, those external prizes like candy or a new game when, when children are doing things that, you know, are building their capacity. But I actually rather would shift that to something like a special, a special time with you, with the parent, right? Or getting to do a special art project together or a play date with a friend. Even as a teacher, right? Often my prizes for students building their capacity over time was they got to have lunch with me and they got to select, you know, two other friends to have lunch with and they got to play inside with our, you know, our Play-Doh and other special toys. Right. So better to have um, better to have those prizes be something that really builds your relationship together um, rather than just like these, you know, external things like candy or toys or, um, you know, a new piece of clothing. OK, so here are some of these um, strategies that and, and resources for all of these strategies that you can implement at home. I'm going to drop. I made this into a bitly. And you can feel free to share this. You'll see that when you click on it, um, it opens up. I'll see if I can get it here so we all can see it to the same slide. Uh, again, feel free to share this. And so these are all of these um, resources. This first one is an article that I wrote that this is based off of, this session is based off of. It is a parent, it's meant to be a parent facing document and it's already translated into Spanish. So it's in, in English and in Spanish. So again, feel free to read that over or share it with, um, you know, with other, with, uh, with, with families that you work with. These are all of those tech tools that we talked about. Do it, uh, DIY fidgets, but you can buy these in lots of different places. How to make um, glitter jars and then other offline brain break activities. Okay, so now we're gonna open it up for, for comments, for questions, commitments. I would love for people to um, share out uh, or you can put, them, put your questions or comments in the chat, but I would love to hear from folks if you're willing to come off of mute and, and talk it out, what's coming up for you? We have a particular student that's been having a really hard time, and I think the glitter jar um, is a is a good way maybe to manage his anger. Mm -hmm. um, Robin, thanks for sharing. Again, I I use glitter jars when I was a classroom teacher, and I I would talk with the with my whole all of my students because it was something I used with all of them about why we're using it and why it's an also is an example of like what's happening in your brain when you're upset. Um, so it, it serves both of this like a, a visual representation to help children understand what is happening when they're when they're upset or they feel sort of out of control and also gives them a space to calm down and you can make it with them. Love that commitment. Thanks, Robin. Hi, Kate. My hi. name is Will. Hi, what Will. You, hi. What do you suggest for building parent confidence to be able to be helpful at home? Yeah. Uh, you know, honestly, I think first it's giving them some, helping them to identify what maybe is happening with their child, right? 
and then get empowering them to give them some strategies to, to use at home. So I know for me, um, for example, when I was a classroom teacher, I had a student, Leonardo, um, who I loved, you know, first grader, very disorganized. <laughs> and his mom was really, was really struggling at home because he also was very disorganized and not just with his like schoolwork, um, but just in his home life. So the first thing was just identifying, like co-identifying that with her, that like that is, he's not purposely like ignoring you or try, but like it's actually about organization. And so we just talked about what are some simple things that you can do? Okay, you have, you have a kitchen table. All right, what does Leonardo do when he comes home? Um, oh, he throws his backpack like in his room. I was like, okay, so why don't we first create a routine where Leonardo can take his homework folder and all of his notebooks out and put it in a basket on the kitchen table. So like that we're creating this routine together. So I think it's again, giving, giving them some, um, uh, some support and identifying what is going on with their child and then empowering them with some real strategies to support them. Another example, Will, is that reading directions. A lot of families will say like, I, you know, maybe I have a fifth grader. I should, I'm not allowed to help him or her read the directions to their, you know, to their science homework. Why, right? I, again, I think just empowering parents to say, you can totally read the directions to your child. It's okay. We want them to be focused on the actual task in that, you know, reading assignment and that math assignment, science assignment, read the directions to them, clear the lane for that so that they can actually do the real work. But a lot of times parents don't, you know, don't think that it's okay or they don't feel empowered to do that. So identifying the, the strategy and then empowering them with a strategy they can use at home. And that's why that article that um, I posted, this one, what we talked about today are those strategies, right? And give, giving parents is a really simple thing that you can give out to parents to help them um, with some easy to use, you know, zero cost strategies to implement at home. I think there's just so many good ideas there that um, I might just pick out a couple strategies at a time to send to the whole group of parents and work on that. those. And then when you have specific need with one parent, present that strategy. Um, Cause it's stuff we all use in our class and they're great mm -hmm. strategies, so. Right. Yeah, and I think again, I really did some crowdsourcing with my, with my friends who, you know, teach um, students with special needs who teach different grades. And they're like, I just, w I wish it was more families just knew about this stuff. And sometimes as teachers, it's hard to have these like one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, so again, this is, um, it, these are, I love the idea of just rolling it out slowly to give people some, some support. Any other questions coming up for folks? Oh, let's see in the chat. The link to the presentation. Um, I, uh, do, I think I can do that. Um, Kathy, is that okay? Are you going to record? Are you are we, you're recording this? Yes, we are recording it, and they will should be able to find the recording in Canvas in the um, conference. The can within Canvas. There will be a link there to the recording. Great. Let's see. Go. My questions come through. Oh no problem. Thanks, Noemi. <laughs> Any other questions coming up for folks or just other commitments? Like I, I loved how Bonnie was like, I'm gonna share, I'm gonna slowly roll these out or other strategies that she may have um, with her families just to build their own capacity. So again, I'm gonna drop, um, this into the, the bit.ly link again into the chat. Feel free to use, to send this out, to use this um, I, however you see fit. Um, again, I made this all for you, so it was easy to share.
again, a lot of, um, there's way, there's so many other like tech tools and other strategies. But again, this is just a, a pared down list uh, to really support in those areas of focus, language and, and SEL. You know, Kate, I just have to say something because I yeah. taught online for five years and just and just left um, the Nevada Learning Academy. But this is valuable. I wish we would have had something like this that we could have sent to parents. Parents could have attended. Mm -hmm. You know, we send out like a, a document, but it doesn't have all that information that you have. So I really appreciate everything that you shared. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. I think there's also, in my experience, there's also like sometimes a misconception that like, oh, if a parent, like if a parent like went to college or if we're in a, if we're in a district that is of a higher socioeconomic status that parents know, or, you know, or a lower, the parents like know how to do these things. And often like that isn't, that isn't true, right? Like it's, there's, these are some, these are some real skills that um, a lot of, a lot of parents struggle with how to implement with their child. Um, and again, really no cost or very, very minimal, low cost things that you can do at home um, that can go a really long way with supporting um, kids and building that capacity. Exactly. We all know that this is not going away. Because no. <laughs> we just saw, I mean, the school I was working at went from like 300 kids to about 10,000. Within about three months this year. So, so we know this is not going away. Digital or online learning is pretty much here probably to stay. Yep. Has an, in, like in a blended format. Yep, and exactly. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. everyone, um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, again, these are our Twitter handles at LinkPD. We have this really great conference coming up in November called LinkStream. It's a completely 100% um, free comp digital conference. Um, with sessions, um, we'll have, I don't know, probably like 15 to 20 different sessions. So if you just give, give us a follow on at link PD and you can, you can come and attend. It's really fun. We have people from all over the world who come to our link stream um, events. It was so great being with Nevada um, today. I know you've had a lot of learning. It's pretty impressive that you're coming and joining us on a, on a Saturday. So um, I appreciate all of you. Uh, I will stick around if, again, if, if other people have questions or other things they want to follow up with, um, but you all have been great. I really appreciate all of the engagement today. Thank you, Kate. And you guys, I put in the chat room um, or in the chat area that uh, the link again, in case you didn't do the attendance and the session survey. And again, I just have to say that these link web conferences that she's talking about in November, I'll probably be there because I attended one in May that was just fabulous and they have all kinds of great stuff to do with blended learning and digital learning that it's there's so much information they have and it, it will make your teaching um it will improve your your strategy for teaching so thank you kate appreciate it yeah thank you so much for the shout out kathy and i just put into our chat that's our that's our website Again, you can find lots of other stuff on there, um, blog posts, all of that, all of that good stuff. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Noemi. Thanks, Sheila. Appreciate it. <laughs> Glad that you learned something today. That was my goal. <laughs>